I'll, right. I'll do a bit of a formal introduction then. So um, Peter Snell is uh, based in Perth. He does a lot of uh, presentations for Perth Group. Uh, you would have also seen him at Symposium, I think. I think it was the last one or second no, last 2018, one? 2018. 2018, that far back, right, where, where he, he basically pulled apart Delphi at runtime, like we looked down down to the uh, bit level at objects, uh, looked at uh, you know how they how they work one byte at a time. So it was uh, a, probably the lowest level look at Delphi that I've ever seen. It blew my mind and I've had a lot of good feedback from that. So uh, we're pretty happy to bring Peter back for his second uh, symposium presentation. So uh, Peter's topic is on design patterns. He's, he's done a few of these talks to Perth um, over the years. It, it tends to numb your brain the first time you hear it and you go through it a few times and, and you start to see that there's a, you know, a lot of interesting bits, a lot of benefits to it. So uh, that's why we decided to bring uh, Peter in. So Peter, I'll throw it over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so, so software patterns in Delphi. Now, um, so I'm Peter Janelle. My business name is Batsoft. And you can find the whole presentation and a lot more of it at the GitHub, Adult Perth, and person you can, you can see this, this link down here. Um, I didn't know initially how long this presentation was going to be. So I kind of present, uh, over, over prepared a whole stack of it. And then, yeah. So I'm just going to uh, go through. Oh, by the way, um, a lot of, a lot of, um, what I'm doing actually uses this library. I'll just show you here in, in Get It, Act Manager, you go to libraries, and it's the first one. <clears throat> I'm just waiting for the libraries thing to, okay, so this is my, there we go, oh, yep, libraries. And so uh, this is taking longer than intended, sorry. That's off library here. Um, I tried to demo that a few months ago and there were a bunch of teething problems, but now we have to 4.2 and the teething problems are gone pretty much. Um, so this, they basically just, it, they're just my own, it, it, it's just my own library that I use for my own projects. And I figured I use this a lot. Other people might have a use for it. So it's out there for you to use as donation web. So um, that said, um, what, uh, I've come across lots of developers who have said pretty close to these exact words. Ah, oh, yeah, software development, software patterns. I don't know patterns. That's advanced programming. I no, I should learn patterns, but I haven't got around to it. First of all, you do know patterns. You all of us use patterns. It's not advanced programming. You know, there are things like collections and singletons and lazy loading. All these are all these are patterns. I know I should learn patterns. Well, yeah, because they will increase your tool set. So don't fear patterns, you're already using them. All right, um, so what are they? Well, they're recurring techniques that have been identified as recurring techniques and then being named. That's pretty much what they are. So oh, I, I use this technique every so often. I'll just give it a name. So instead of having to describe it every time, I can just refer to it by a concise name. And that's, that leads on to the next page. So concise terms. Yesterday I bought a new four-wheel thing that one travels in. Yesterday I bought a new car. Well, car is more concise and it also involves a lot of other things. It means, you know, it's not a skateboard, it's a car. So that means an engine, steering column, uh, suspension, seats, and so on. So there's a lot more to it. So knowing, for example, what an abstract pattern, uh, uh, what an abstract factory is, for example. You have, a, you have an idea of what, what's involved in making one and how one uses it as compared to a concrete factory, for example. So there are all these other things that you, with a, with a car, you need to start an engine. You wouldn't do that with skateboard. Um, there are all these other things that you get along with it. So you have these concise terms for more complex concepts. Uh, the other, the other benefit is you use them as building blocks. So when you, when you, um, how do I say this? You have a concept as a distinct, as a distinct concept. Like, ah, this is a factory, not oh, something that goes and creates these other things like I've done before, if you just call it a factory. Then, or, or, or a 
Ramalditon uh, concept or uh, observer. We, we're going to have a look at those later. Then when you think of them like that, you think of them as distinct blocks that you can put together to get, to get more complex architectures. So if you have a look at these blocks here, I mean, this is a yellow cylinder resting atop a, a smaller blue box kept in, kept in place by two orange blocks. That's much easier to describe than the whole pattern as a, as a whole. Can you see my mouse? Can you see my mouse blowing around? Yep. Yes, we can. So this picture is a hell of a lot more difficult to describe than this in relation to this, in relation to these. So if you keep each, each pattern, each uh, module distinct, then although you're building a more complex architecture that will do things, then you still, you still keep a tidy architecture, both in the way you think of it, in your mind, in the way you describe it, in words and diagrams, in your code, in your testing, in your maintenance, everything becomes effectively leaner and cheaper by doing things in a tidy manner and patterns help with that. They are basically like conceptual building blocks. Um, and then um, I put that other one in uh, too soon. So the, other, the third thing is new ideas. Don't you re reinvent wheels? Lots of people have already solved problems that, um, that you come across in, and they solve them in nifty ways. So if you learn the patterns, what you do is you increase your tool set. So um, you can get some really, really powerful patterns that really make your code much more concise and easily maintained. So, why don't we learn, learn from some of those, those other experts? Now, patterns work best, and this is my one of my big gripes here, is, um, let me go back to this one, let's just put it in. Consider using a proper business layer. So this is the business layer. This is where we, where we typically do our architecture, this green stuff here. And with our data where we have our forms that then um, talk to, say this is a data module with some you know, data sets and so on, and they talk about the database, you get very little control over the functionality between here. And that's fine if what you're doing is editing data in a database. But once you're doing something far more complex, you need a business layer. And that's where the forms shouldn't, in my opinion, never talk directly to the data layer or the database. They should always talk to our business objects in the business layer, and they in turn, talk to a data layer. I can show an example of that later. Now that's, that's, that's my view. And uh, although these will change values in here, these will bounce back values and so you get a turnaround. And that's actually MVVM, which is, I was touting about 20 years ago. Couldn't understand. Um, and Delphi is eminently built exactly for that. It's, um, it, it had that far, uh, much before a uh, .NET did. So, an overblown example. It's a singleton factory that produces T first countertons with subscribers. Makes total sense um, once you know what all those things mean. There are four patterns there singleton, factory, multiton, subscribers. We'll revisit that later once I've shown you some examples. And um, uh, that should make much more sense. Now, there are criticisms. Of course, are criticism. uh, 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 there are criticisms. So we'll just look at, um, at the four that I found. Other languages don't need many patterns. So some people think that patterns are a consequence of an inadequate language. That's, that doesn't make sense because regardless of the language, you are going to have recurring techniques, hence patterns different tools, different strengths. So they'll have different sets of patterns, patterns that are just, uh, that are unique to a particular paradigm or language they call idioms. I've discovered doing the research. Uh, patterns are used because libraries are incomplete. Well, that also doesn't really make sense because some patterns are part of libraries. Containers are a good example. T-list, T-dictionary, stack, queue, uh, arrays, just you know, like that dynamic arrays, all these are containers, but how they're implemented differs, but they are in, well, actually arrays are part of the language, which leads us to the next, next one. Some patterns are part of the language, so 
arrays or containers in, in, in the language. Abstractions, interfaces and base classes are ways of implementing abstraction patterns. Some of them we use as a natural part of our process. So composites, that's when you typically have a tree structure of, of objects. Um, and forms, frames, data modules are good examples of that, where you have um, component, your T component, your T component architect, um, uh, tree structure. So you'll have your form with panels and buttons and edit boxes in a nice big tree structure. That's part of our process of developing a form or a frame. But that is built on the idea of composites, which is a pattern. Uh, the third criticism is patterns are too rigid. Well, you need to understand the concept of a pattern. The concept of, is, is what's important. And you go online and you say, this is how a pattern is implemented. And that's fine as a starting point, but don't get hung up on it. I'm going to jump ahead and show an example of singleton. Now, I know many people don't like singletons. They think it's a very bad pattern. Nevertheless, it's a pattern and it's good for this example. So here we have an interface section. We have T global, there's an object, and we want a, and a global variable called global. This is the sort of thing we get um, when we look at forms, for example. Here uh, we have our T4 main or type T form, and here's a global variable called form main. So that's a very common way of, of implementing patterns, um, singletons in Delphi. Of course, you could subclass this and put my special global and assign that in here. You could mess around with it. Anywhere else in the code can actually replace this object. So if you want to make it a bit more secure, you could apply, it, you could use a global function instead. So it's still the same class. Instead of a global variable, you have a global function. And um, sure, it goes and you know, creates, it gives a lazy, lazy load pattern, for example, and it just returns this global, which is hidden inside the implementation section. It's still a singleton pattern. The third option is to you just use a static class. So drop the T, make everything class variables or class methods. And that way, you absolutely cannot replace global because it's a class. So anything that refers to global refers to, to that class. So there are, three, there are three different ways of implementing the singleton pattern, and it's the simplest of all patterns. So that's what's important, is to understand the idea behind the pattern and how you implement it, and that's secondary. So patterns are too rigid. That's only if you intend to follow them religiously, which is unwise. People use complex patterns unnecessarily. Yes, people often use and misuse recently discovered goodies, but this problem with people's use of things, not of the goodies themselves. When should you use them? When and where appropriate. Patterns are useful tools. Simply using patterns does not make one a good architect, but good architects know many patterns and how to use them because they're tools. You're just increasing your tool set and are able to cobble them together and describe concepts. Uh, in, in your documentation and to colleagues uh, more concisely. Are there any questions about that? Okay, are you, have, is, is anyone still awake? For sure. Okay. <laughs> all right, cool, I just had to check. Oh no. Thank you. <laughs> so let's look at some code now, all right? So, um, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, just gonna show you this one here. So here we have, um, just a little demo. We just have a bunch of uh, people here, um, and we can go and edit these people. We can go there, and go, uh, I mean, we can pop them up here, and we can go and edit someone, you know. And you can see there that we have changes that then apply all throughout the application, right? We can go and reset that, and that's fine. So I'll show you how this, this way of, so where's Kylie Jackson, for example? That's number nine, yeah, there we go. So there, for example, and see there's another person. So I'll show you how this works. Before I do that, I just want to make sure everyone is clear on, I mean, you're all experienced developers, you should all, uh, Delta developers, you're, you're aware of this, but you've got your, your main form. This helps you understand how I draw my diagrams as well. The main form with methods. 
the main form owns, that's what, the, that's what this diamond means here, it owns a button called T-Show and an edit called edit, uh, edit name. And they've got the on click and on edit events that then when you click that button, it will call on a button show click, for example, that can call populate and blah. So, and this is part of your, your components, your uh, T-form uh, components. So looking at that there, that's very much, you know, here we have list all and list filter. And we look here, we've got list all and list filter. And of course, when we look at that, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Um, there's list all click, list all click, and there it is. And, and it just, just calls those methods. So that's that, that's that. But the thing, the point about this is that an on click event is, uh, for lack of a better term, a method pointer. Strictly speaking, a method pointer is two pointers. It's a record of two pointers, but that's beside the point. Consider this to be a it point. It refers to one single method of a, of a given object. So with an observer pattern, what we have instead is where we have a business object. It doesn't have to be, but it typically is a business object. And it owns the T-notify events. Notice the plural there, events. So it can point to a whole bunch of different events. So when, for example, this the values inside here change inside the subject, that's the name of this of this part here. When the subject changes, it can invoke or call t, the T notify events and say, hey, you call all the callback events. So then calls all of all three of them. So not just one and one but three, you can call three or four. So then what happens is that another observer comes along. Let's say we have a fourth observer here and it also wants to be notified. So what it does is it subscribes to the notify events. Hence it, uh, observers are those objects that have subscribed to the events. And so that's why it's called a subscriber pattern or an observer pattern. They're two names for the same concept. And that's what happens here. So if we look at unit person, for example, here's the person. And whenever we change a personal name or a family name, we, we change that and we say on change call. Cool. So we so we call. So that way. Um, and here's the on change, it's a T notify events. And so, which by the way, we create. So when we create the T person, we create the T notify events like that. And uh, I'm just gonna back, go, go back to there. So that way, anything that's subscribed to this gets called. So let's see examples of those that have subscribed to this. Uh, there we go to brain person, here's one. So, a subscription. I've got, I have two two implementations of of the of, of the observer pattern. I'll show you in a moment. But this one here, as long as you hold on to your sub subscription, you have your subscription. As soon as you let you, you you let go of it and that object dies, you unsubscribe. So here, what we have is um, we assign it. We we get a, we get a new person if we have one. Then we can say on person. The person unchanged subscribe, and this is a method that we want to. Um, this here, person changed, that's that one there. So that's the method that, that we want to subscribe to. So that's the sub subscription method there. So doing it this way, it's it's very easy and very simple to have lots of places in code that can be notified when something happens, a message arrives or some data changes or whatever it may be. Um, you, obviously, you know, you, you can have lots of different codes, parts of the code finding out at the same time. So you might have one that logs something, another one that shows on the screen, another one that actually does some processing uh, when new information comes in. Uh, any questions? Are you still alive? <laughs> yep, okay. So 
Um, so that, that's up there. Now, of course, if we have a look here, um, we, we're going on to the next pattern now, which is the Melchiton pattern. So we've got here a couple of people called, called Carly Jackson. How do we know that they call, call that there are two different people called Carly Jackson? It's because their personal IDs are different. So that's how, how can we know that? But um, if, yeah, so these ones here with number nine, they're, they're both, they're both pointing, both of these frames, or these two forms are pointing to the same object with person ID name. So when one of them changes the data, the object receives that, 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 uh, that change and tells everyone who's listening, oh, that it be this, this, and this, they all recipients. And you go, they all subscribe to person ID 9 and they go, ah, there is a change. I will update myself. But that relies upon all these places looking at the one and the same person ID. If you have a whole bunch of objects called person ID nine, I don't know, they, you know, which one are you listening to? Are you listening to the same one? Are you listen to different ones? One of them changes, but the other ones don't change. So you need that, uh, that cohesiveness. And this is, this is what's called a multi-ton. So whereas a singleton, you can only have a single instance of a class. A multi-ton, you can have multiple instances of a class, but each instance must be unique. Each instance must uniquely represent that thing, in this case, a person. So each person here has its own unique ID. If you have two T persons with, with the same ID, that ceases to be a multi -term. Does that make sense? Yeah? So how do you enforce this? Well, you could use a factory. A factory is an object that creates things, right? So if a shoe factory creates shoes, and a car factory creates cars, then an object factory creates objects. That's, that's a simple idea of, that's basically what a factory is. So looking at that, um, we can close this. So I don't need that now. I'm going to have a look in here. So person, for example, we have the factory here. T person factory, it's a singleton. See that global variable, singleton? There we go, that's one of the patterns. And it's a factory that, in, that goes and creates that. So we can go and create an object, a new one. And what it will do is we'll create a new person and it will return that person. Um, we'll just it will return a new person. Uh, question? No? Okay. Or we can ask for an existing one already. So, um, so what we can do is say, well, if, 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 it's, if the person ID is no person, then don't return anything. Otherwise, try to find it in memory. If you don't find it in memory, then create it, populate it, and then return it. If you do find it in memory, then you just return it. Okay, so in this case, this factory here, it creates things, but it oh, sorry, it creates things, but it also keeps track of them in memory. So because you have a factory, it's a central location to go and create T person objects. Instead of going creating T person objects willy nilly throughout your code, by having this one central point, the factory, you can start enforcing rules about how these things are created and maintained within your program, right? So if we switched off the, the use of this uh, altogether, so if we do, so they are not multi -tons. we switch off multi -tons. then when we go into here, we're gonna create this, all right? And boom, there it is. All this code where we're using the, the memory that it's all gone. We're just saying, you know what? Not a person, return no. Otherwise, create a person, populate it, and you're done. All right. So now when we list them, yeah, sure, we can get them. But that person object is not the same as this person object, is not the same as this person object, because every time we're getting a new object, because they all always ask for it. So when you do this, that one's object has changed, but these ones haven't. But by enforcing 
that they're always unique, then we start using that. Um, we start using, we are again using this. We're again using this. And so what that means is they are now, um, they are now looking at the same thing, right? Or something like that, right? So then that, there they are. So does that uh, see the, does that show you the, the, the use of having a factory, a central factory? Is that, yeah. is that useful? Yeah, okay. So uh, the next way, uh, thing is an abstract factory. Um, I, I'm trying to think of an example I have. I, oh shit, sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I happen to rest my finger on the on the right button, um, right arrow. So the, um, I can't think of, of, of an example of the abstract effect in my demos now. I was going to make one using employment. Ah, oh, no, no, that's not. Okay, so the idea is that an abstract factory, now an abstract factory isn't actually a factory. It only pretends to be a factory. It's actually using what I call the, 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 the registration pattern, which is not one of the formal ones, but I don't care. It's something that I use so frequently that I've identified it and not named it. So it's a registration pattern. So what you do is you register concrete factories. Now, the, the concrete not being a noun, because then they're producing concrete. Concrete being the adjective. They are concrete. They are actual factories. So uh, what we do is we register factories. So in the, we have a car factory, boat factory, and factory. And then when, we, when somewhere else in the code wants to get a new vehicle, what they, what they do is they call create new with some parameters. This will then work out which factory to actually use. This is going to do the actual work. And then defers it. So, oh, oh this is actually a boat. All right, so then I'm going to use this one here. Then it calls, it calls that factory's build method. So it calls this method here. And this boat factory creates a boat. So this then returns a boat. So an abstract factory isn't a factory. It's a register of factories. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, OK. Um, so anyway, uh, if we now go back to this example, it's a singleton factory that produces T-person multitons with subscribers. Does that now make sense? Yeah. Yeah, anyone struggling with this still? And you're welcome to struggle, I understand, because I've been loving kind of fast. Anyone? Not struggling, Peter, but rather the question about how you load that stuff. When you click that all list buttons, yes. uh, is it actually one at a time that it's loaded, or are you loading all of them and making them available to your different controls? I'm loading them all at once. Well, what I'm actually doing, I've, I've cheated, right? So I've got my T person store here is actually. Um, it's not loading it from a database. It's actually okay. just just randomly generating. So if I just switch that one back there, um, uh, they just ra they just ra randomly generate it. You know, there's no right. um, uh, what's the name now? Um, Kylie something or other. Okay. okay, this this is really more a question about the database guys versus the object guys, right? And um, yeah, uh, and so um, what? What you would do, so I'll, I'll, I'll go show you here. Um, so what I've done here in the personal factory, when I create it, I've, I supply a store. Now this store is an interface, load person IDs, and there's a person filter here. And then I can load the, I can basically populate the person and I can uh, populate the person, I can save that person. I can ask for a new ID. So if this was talking to an actual database, then this would load these things. Like then the implementation of this would know how to talk to the database. But because it's a demo application, I have this this uh, person store random. So I can I can replace this very easily. And this is this is a this is called abstraction. This is a pattern called abstraction, and it's incredibly powerful. And to just use a data module with data with uh, with data sets, and just talking straight to the data sets, eradicates the, the possibility to do this. 
Um, I stop using data where controls and I shy away from, um, I'm sorry to say this, but uh, shy away from um, uh, live bindings because they actually, they actually made the program so much less maintainable that it just wasn't worth the price. Doing it this way, it's very clean and I can put in stubs, I can put in tests, I can change things very easily. And I have a very clear view of what I need to do, of what needs to be accessible from the database. And I can still keep things very efficient. So my person store that talks to the database will often, the implementation will often be a data module with queries and update statements and all the rest of it. I still use the data sets and the data connections and the data modules, but I just avoid my controls talking to them. So that's coming back to this diagram, these diagrams over here. Uh, these ones here. I avoid a data aware like a plague and try to do everything like this. And this actually saves me time and is more maintainable. It looks like more work up front, but I never miss deadlines doing it this way. Um, so anyway, that's my little thing. Uh, we all have our different ways, I suppose. So, um, so the, using this abstraction here means that I can swap out my person store at will. Now, shall I? Yeah. Using on, this. Target. Hmm? Questions? Oh, I can't see a note that this is being recorded on screen. Oh. Oh, that wasn't for you, Peter. Oh, it wasn't for me. Oh, no. Is this, is this someone else? Uh, questions? Oh, okay. Best um, send it to Scott. Stuff I'm like that. I'm recording it. Okay. So um, the other thing is when you have an interface like this that, that where you can swap out the actual implementation and that can change the behavior of the application in a big way, that's called a strategy. What strategy are we going to use? Are we going to use the random store or are we going to use a database store or are we going to use a JSON, JSON file store or whatever, right? So it's a strategy. So that's another pattern called strategy where we uh, can have different kinds of person stores. Uh, does that answer your, your, your initial question there about how I go about fetching these? So in this yeah, case, yeah. thanks. In this case, I am actually going to load them given a certain filter. So I'll load them. I'll load up actually all the IDs. Yes, I'll load the IDs and then T people. Just having a look here. T people. Yeah, I'm actually, I think I'm actually loading people objects all up. I'm loading a loading a bunch of IDs, I think, and then loading and then and then. Yeah, person IDs. Yeah, so I'm 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 loading the person IDs. That's right, and then I'm populating each one. I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. Yeah, just gonna make sure that I'm not. Uh, no, yeah, no, uh, whatever. Just Sorry, but that's exactly why I ask, right? Um, in in the Ruby on Rails project that I did a while ago, uh, I like the idea that you can use the objects as such. But if you want to actually get a list of stuff, you can also set put your SQL in, and it gets you straight away. And yes. the problem is that the object guys say, no, 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 I'm loading an object at a time. And that's what you're doing. You've got your ID list and every time you need a new object. Well, uh, you're no, asking... no, not quite. So this is, this is, this is a, perhaps a bad example. Um, what I usually do in practice is I will actually load, uh, I, will, I will run a query and give me all the idea, uh, uh, all the data at once because Having lots of lots of calls is too much turnaround time. You want one single. You want to minimize the number of calls to the database. So you will load. Uh, so this is this is a demo. So this is not quite how I do it in in real life because efficiency is important. So I'll have a single query that does one turnaround time to the database, fetches exactly those people I want and all the information I want, and then I use that to then populate those objects and then return them. 
So I only do one one ten round trip to the database. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's because it's an example and it's it's simplified. But in yeah. real life, you wouldn't do it that way. Yeah, uh, I would I would look at at being more efficient. And this is again one of those things where there's not one way to do things. Uh, you have to look at your particular situation and write accordingly um, and, and, and design your code accordingly. So the, the, the thing I was saying about the right way to design, to um, there's one way to do patterns or something like that. Uh, uh, what was it now? Patterns are too rigid. No, no, no. There, are, there are different ways of actually implementing the patterns. So yeah. Um, anyway, so that, yeah, uh, there we go. Um, so that is, is that okay? Um, does that, does that, does that satisfy you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I just, 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 just want to make, make sure that, that, that all is, all is well and good. So, um, that's actually a whole bunch of patterns. So looking, looking back at this and I'm just going to, uh, okay, that's one way of doing it. Um, that actually probably helps a bit. So does this then make sense? The single thing factory produces, yeah, okay. Let's have a look at a different uh, app altogether. Let's look at the, actually this one of the, the next one I was I think look at was, was the Mementos pack. The Memento. So you perhaps noticed here that when we were running this, we had, um, you know, I can I can edit this person here, and then go. Ah, oh, actually, I want to undo that. Bam. So this is called a, called a memento pack. I'll show you in the in the that's off library that you get from Get It. Um, the mementos one here. By the way, if you have installed Delphi with D unit testing on, then everything is going to compile and run. If you don't have D unit testing on, then these test apps will not compile. All right. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just you don't have the D unit uh, libraries installed. The demos and the libraries will still work fine. So if you have a look at, uh, at this, um, this Mementos demo here, there are two. Uh, um, there. So what we have, let's do that, one more up, and then bam. So you can see here that we have T person has a age, family name, forget the counter net, notes, and so on. That's this person information here. We have another object called address, which is street and suburb. You can see that here. An address here is a sub object of T person. So this is a sub object of that. Now we can choose whether we want to look at uh, just 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 to the backup, which is what we had in the T person demo, or or a version which has a proper undo and redo. Okay, let's go and create that. Bam. Um, and we'll just pre-populate that. There we go. And so now we have no backups. We have no. Uh, so we'll just do a backup. Bam. There's one. And I can go and change these. So Jane, for example. Are there any changes? Yes, there are changes. What are the changes? Oh, John changed to Jane. Okay, we can do a backup of that. And we can uh, say Jane is uh, younger, undo, you know, undo and, and redo. And we can go here, we can say, you know what? Uh, this is in, um, um, in Big Street, for example, we can back up that. So not only is this keeping track of multiple versions of this object is also keeping track of multiple versions of this object as well, this, this sub object, because we use Memento D, we have this attribute to, to be able to control that. So that's, that pattern is called Mementos. And that's also then available in, in the back library. Um, any questions? Any no questions? Okay. Could you show us again the, um, like your four, um, sorry, Peter. Yeah. Your your forward changes deep in at the moment, don't you? Sorry, I'm what? My forward? Four uh, alterations into the backup, four backups. Yes, I have four backups. So, so the first backup looks like this. John Doe, 29 Main Road. 
Then we do a redo. And the next one I changed to Jane Doe. The next one, third one was 37. And the fourth one was Big Street. So, so your list, it list changes by version or by uh, like uh, total accumulation? Um, it, well, we have four different backups. Uh, and it just depends. And we're just looking at them with an in, uh, index beginning at one. And we're just, we're just, we're just looking at, at, at them like an array of them, if, if you like. So if you go list changes now, what do we get? Well, there are no changes compared to this, this one here. So there are no changes. But if I then go and, um, and then change this a bit here, well, right. now there are changes right. after right. version four. Gotcha. So, yeah. Um, and when we, and talking about that, is that, is that, is that cool? I was just uh, wondering, is it any, oops, someone else is talking. Go ahead. I, I was going to ask, are you actually creating whole instances um, in that backup library? Yes, I am, but only instances. So I'm not, I'm not storing the data as text or anything like that. I'm, st I'm storing, uh, I'm, I'm making, I'm basically making a memory backup. Uh, and then for things like strings, I'll, 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 you know, I can't just do a straight, copy of that, I need to copy out the string as well, and sort of refer to, uh, yeah, to uh, copy, copy the strings separately, like that, that dynamic arrays and that sort of thing as well. So yes, I am making backups. Um, so they're not, they're not just the alterations, they're not, they're not the deltas, they're actually del uh, copies of the, of the object itself. Now you see here the backup ones. So you see here we have, we have uh, mementos that is the abstract superclass. But then we have the memento backup. Now there are two versions, backup fields and backup properties. So backup is leaner, but you only have one backup. Whereas uh, the versions, memento versions, again, fields and properties, you have many different versions. And then, you, and then you can um, uh, you can then do your undo and redo as well. That's why this one's longer because it, it does more. But you can then see here mementos. That there is actually a container, uh, or a, a rather, it, it is a collection. It is a container as well. Uh, it is a collection of the different backups, whereas the backup only has a single pointer for that. Um, but of the two, fields and properties, I advise that you always use fields because properties can have setter methods that can change the state of things, right? So as a, as a general rule, unless you know what you're doing, it's probably best to just stick with fields. And deep and ignore just help you control what you're doing. So yes, any, 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 any questions still? No, okay, moving on. I, I have one. Yep. It only, it only just occurred to me that, um, so this is in uh, FMX, right? Uh, it is in FMX. Uh, well, actually I'll tell you what, um, this one here, so there, there are four uh, vehicles as you can see. This one will run for both uh, FMX and, and, uh, uh, and the VCL. But when you see where it says FMX, they are FMX specific. So these are FMX specific, they require FMX and that's it. However, this other one controls, this one here uh, is again, um, not, not FMX or, or uh, VCL specific. So these two you can use for both. So uh, it, it hadn't occurred to me that um... I think we've seen some of this before in, in WA, and um, so this would run on any of our any of the Delphi platforms. Uh, these should run on any of the Delphi tens. Should run. I haven't I, mean, I haven't those, tested for a while on an earlier version of Delphi across Windows and Android and. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not so sure about the FMX ones, but the library and controls they they, they yes. In fact, the controls I I tend to write things for Android more than uh, more than Windows. Okay. So um, 
these um, these this controls here, for example, this address update. Um, so this is something that was missing in in the Delphi libraries, uh, uh, which was this up. This is the idea that when you do an update using REST, it's different from a post. An update should only contain the deltas, and that's what this one here achieves. In the old case, that Sorry? Sorry? No, Glenn got unmuted. I just muted him again. Am I muted? No, Glenn no, got unmuted. I muted him again. Oh, oh okay. So anyway. Um, there are a bunch of different uh, patterns here. I'm not satisfied with my most recent iteration of settings. Uh, it is still very powerful, but it's not quite what I like. But here we have the observer patterns, mementos, context is, is very useful, and so on. There are a bunch of these, some of these things in classes. But we'll we'll be moving along now to uh, to, to 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 another one, right? So let's go back to the symposium and we'll look at a different app this time. So let's have a look at the critters demo. And the critters demo uh, shows some more advanced patterns, uh, more complex patterns. So here we have, um, let's see if I can just, uh, yeah, there you go. So they're these little things. These are not actually components. Um, uh, they're, they're just little vector drawing things. I'll show you actually what they look like. So if we just close all the others and we just go to critter, for example. So a critter, has a position and it has a, it has a shape, which is a that's a that's a poly that's um, used for polygons for the canvas drawing. It's really very neat, I must say. And a scale, position, direction, and so you can see here if I if I go and select one of these here, we we have uh, these these different values here. Some of these we can we can edit like this, and some we can't. Okay, because I haven't written the editors for them. Or they don't make sense. So position, direction, etc. And so when we want to, um, and so we can just step through, and they can and they can do do their various behaviors. This just steps with a timer, just doing the same, just step, same thing. And uh, what we can do is we can create a new critter. Let's let's do that. Let's create a new critter this time with a circle. Boom. Okay, it's a circle there. Uh, so what I've done is I've created a new critter with a shape being circle, and I've run, uh, gone to find that. Let's just see. So shape, shape, register shape, simple. Yeah. So circle. We then go and go, go and create an ellipse, and we add that. Oh, shut them up. Anyway, I'm trying to try to figure out which one to show first, which pattern to show first. No, I'll show a flyaway first. Okay, so yes, we'll continue with this. So as you can see here, um, we are reusing the same, the same uh, small set of, of pattern uh, of um, shapes repeatedly. So rather than each of each position, each place having a brand new object of it, this is kind of like going back to the Nottington concept of consolidation, right? So rather than having a unique, like uh, each one having a, each circle, having, having the shape of a circle, they just have to point to the one circle and say, I want you to draw this at this position when in that rotation, done. So uh, and, uh, that's called the flyweight. So where you have functionality that is some, that, that lots of objects can use and by switching that, switching which object they use, they end up changing their behavior. So for example, if I was to go to this one, uh, this one here, for example, and I change the shape to what's another one, rectangle, say, okay. All right, so then we refresh that, it's now a rectangle. So it's now using one of the other three shapes. So these things here that they're not just types, actual objects. There are only three of them. And all these places are, are using those. That's that lightweight kind of um, reuse of objects is called flyweight. Another very common example is T-ImageList. T-ImageList is basically flyweight. 
it's not implemented in the, the way that you would see flyweights described online, but it's still flyweight. Conceptually, that's exactly what it is. And it's a very, uh, 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 and it's, and it's very, very useful. You know, you load up the images in one single T image list, and then all these buttons and tab controls and whatever, you know, everywhere else in the app, they just say, yeah, that's my image list. And this is image ID I want, the, the image index. Done. And they all get, get, get that drawn. So that data does not need to be repeated in memory. That concept is a flyweight. Um, I want to show you the registration pattern. So if I show you here a shape, this is a good example of the registration pattern. Here's a shape register. Um, and again, the shape, the registration pattern is my own pattern name because I use it so damn frequently, but I can't find it online, so I just call it register. So there's register. It's a function where I can register the name of the pattern and the actual shape itself. Boom, all right? And then what I can do is I can go and fetch it. I can say, all right, I want my shape register, single team here, shape register by name, and I pass in the name that I'm looking for, say circle or rectangle, and I get that shape. Done, awesome. So um, this here, this, this uh, collection here, dictionary, there's the shape name, and there's actual shape itself, the shape data. That could just as well be, I mean, I could write this so that it could contain bitmaps, for example. And so what that means is that I can very easily add new shapes without having to alter any code at all. And that's a really important thing for maintenance, to be able to add new functionality without altering code. You add code, but you don't need to mess around with other code that's already there. So the code for this is, uh, is, is, is pretty concise. So then we come here, just show simple shapes, and we're going to register them. We say, you know what? Um, we're going to uh, shape register register. This is a rectangle, for example. And we have an, an anonymous method here that just does sort of once off and just goes, yep. Here's add rectangle um, and then add direction. That add direction are these little, little notches here. You see. So we can see which direction they're facing. So that's how, how the, and then we just register the next one. Next one, and we can just add, 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 add more, and we just get more, more shapes in this list. Uh, yeah. So, any questions? Otherwise, I'll go on to um, decorators. Decorators are cool. You can see it. Okay. Are you, are you ready? All right. So, let's have a look at critters again. It has this thing called decorators. Now, decorators are objects that you add on to a parent object to add functionality, add behavior. So the critter here, for example, this brand new critter is pretty simple. It's got a draw body. And draw body goes and looks up the actual shape of the body, and that's it. It doesn't do anything. So when I, when I run this, it just sits there. But what I can do is I can add a decorator. Let's say turn, for example. I'm not going to add this decorator. Now I can see it's turning. Let me pause this. And I go in here and I say, you know what? Let's just add that. Increase that to a five and keep on going. And I can see that how it's turning faster. That's all in us. Well, let's give it a move forwards decorator. All right. So we're going to add that. Bam. And now it's moving forwards as well. Slowly. Yes. Uh, admittedly, very slowly. Let's go and change the speed to also five. So now you can see it, it is moving forwards. We have not changed the critter code. We have only added functionality to that critter object. And we can now add functionality, add behavior to it. We can do other things like, for example, um, draw a tail, okay? Add a decorator, bam, then now has a tail, great. So, how would we, uh, and so I'll show you how then how this actually works in terms of um, making the decorator work. So decorators here, 
Uh, here's a little unit, decorators. Um, it's a container of, in this case, just, just, it just interfaces, just interface. It, it, it's an interface list. We don't know what the different decorators do, whether they draw something or whether they move it in some way or some other behavior. We don't know and we don't, we don't care here. This module is only about having decorators. So we can add decorators and we can insert decorate, uh, add inserts, remove a decorator if we wanted to. I don't know that I've actually got that. No, I don't have to have a remove decorator button here, but okay. Um, suppose I could do like a double click or something. I don't know, anyway. Um, and then we can go through them. But you also have here run. So what we want to do here is we want to be able to call a runner, which is a decorator runner here, which is just a, um, an, an, anonymous, an anonymous function. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so that it can then pick which of the things it wants to, which, which type of decorators, and then run them. So if we have a look at the main form, which is where we do this. And I'm just going to get a step because uh, critters step. Okay, here we go. So the critters has a thing called step, um, which is going to go through all its iterate, all its decorators. So here's a script, the critter, critter with its decorators. And it has, uh, and this decorators has a step method, which is going to iterate through all its all its uh, so four of our critter in itself because I am the critters I'm the, I'm the container of the um, say so what oh yeah 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 this is a container of all the critters and I want to go through every single critter and I want to pick pick pick, pick each de critters decorators and I want to run this this code here and what this does is it checks all right for each critter um each each critter's decorators so decorators on the go all the decorators of this critter and i want to see if the decorator implements the step interface if so then call that step method all right so i step has a step method and if it does it calls it so looking here uh, i can tell you that turn and move forwards are both step methods. And we can see that here. We go to behavior, turn, and move forwards. You could see them here. Move forwards and turn, right? So those are then behaviors that that are registered in this in uh, in uh, in this critter decorators uh, register. This is this is a register here. So we can register all our different critters uh, in here. Uh, it just just makes it make them easier to to find, and so I think I'm losing people now. But the idea is basically that we can add these these quite easy. I want to show you though how we can add a functionality. Um, so whether it's decorative behavior is that decorative painting goes and draws bodies, fills bodies, draws extra, and so on. So it draws tails and fins. Let's add another behavior called four. Just so I can show you how we can add functionality to this um, this program uh, this program without actually changing any classes. Uh, oh, only 50, 15 minutes to go. Okay. Oh crap! Do I have time for that? Okay. Tell you what. Instead of doing that, I'll say this. There are a whole bunch of other patterns. Would you like me to talk about some of these I've managed to cover? Fly weight, facade, decorators, dependency injection was the next one I was going to uh, show you, and chain of responsibility. Would you like me to continue? Uh, I'd like a vote. Who would like me to uh, talk uh, to show you an example of adding code without modifying? Or dependency, the three, five, and six. Anyone interested in anything, in anything in particular? What would you like to do? Four. <laughs> Come on, we've only got 15 minutes to go. Five. Well, what do we do? We type it in the chat, do we? Which number? 
No, uh, you no, you just you just 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 tell me. Good um, idea. Just unmute yourself. Can you cover any of these in fifteen minutes? Sorry. Given that there's, uh, we're looking at fifteen minutes. Oh, um, okay. Are all of those okay to cover in fifteen minutes? Not all of them. No. So three and six and don't care. So three and six. Okay. So come on, chain of responsibility, defense injection. Okay. Let's. Oh, sorry. Um, we can look at command in that case. I think you're bored of this particular example, so we'll move on. Okay, but the idea, I'll just finish off that. So the idea, idea is that I just do, do T for, uh, and I just, just create a new one of these, and then I would register it here. Peter. And lo and behold, we would then have another decorator option that we can then add to our, to our critters. So, Peter. yeah. Sorry, do you mm -hmm. have a favorite pattern? No, they're just, they, they, it, it just depends on what pattern is uh, suitable for the task at hand, really. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. Um, so, commands. Okay, let's go to commands. Um, yes, time for questions as well. Oh, crap. Okay. So commands, that would be context here. This is not a very good demo, but hopefully it'll, it'll uh, give you the, 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 the idea. So commands, I mean, here's, here, here's a small scripting program, right? Uh, I have a couple of macros set and show, and I've got here show, uh, look at the form caption. So if we just run this now, show, look at the form caption. It's a, it is context demo, all right? It is. I'm going here, form caption is context demo. This is actually more about the context. The context is this, and this is actually a very, very nice, very powerful way of handling main values in different, um, in, in a nested manner. It's actually really nicely powerful. Um, so then what it does is it's gonna go set the form caption, bam. Has, it's done that now. That's that's changed. And can, can you see the change? That's actually showing. Um, that's no longer whatever it was before. Um, and then we can go and change. Uh, we, we can set set these values, and we now have um, we now have these these values that have been set. So um, A B C is alpha beta gamma as a string. Um, and X, Y, Z is uh, four. I just altered something there. So four, uh, because it came from children, can't, whatever. So how this works um, is first of all, you need to have an, uh, a parser that will parse your, um, your uh, different, come on, open up. I've been up, I haven't looked at this for weeks. Um, so we can register macro names and the command. The command is really just, I use anonymous methods for commands. I think they're flipping awesome. Um, so I can show you here, when we're going to register commands, what we do is we, if we say, for example, I just, um, replace content register commands. So here we are registering the show command. So we have the macro show, which is a constant up here, boom, show. And then we have the actual command itself. This is what it actually does. So uh, the, the macro show, for example, goes through all the remaining parameters in that string. So what we do, what I've done is I've broken up that string. Um, should keep this thing, just leave it running. So if we have a look here, that's the first. So I just, I just take each line in turn and I just use a um, T string list with space as a delimiter. And I, and I, and I delimit uh, this thing. So, so, so I get a whole, you know, each, each thing becomes its own um, line, right? Um, in, 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 in its own um, element in the, in the T string list. And I just look at the first one, show. Do I recognize that? Yep, that is a recognized macro. 
and so therefore I will I will go and go and create um, a um, or, or go and obtain um, an instance of this anonymous method. And so when you have a macro that contains a whole bunch of, of macros, really, it's just a you know, it, 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 it's a con it's a it's a collection of, of uh, more of these um, uh, these macro commands. So so you can then have that nested. So when you're then going to run them, you can then see here macro lines. So this one here goes and delimits them, as I said, you know, with the space delimited, blah blah blah. And then we go and we call uh, that. Then goes and nests this and just goes through each one because the macros, the macro, um, the macro lines. That is just a the macro lines context, whatever. Anyway, we get a, a collection of those and we just execute them one after the next. Bam, 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 bam. But we use context, and context is very powerful. And I don't think we have time for that. Um, the idea is, oh, how to say this? Uh, that other example was actually a better example for, for, for context. But the idea is, and this is, is an implementation of multiple patterns, but here's an abstraction of has value, get value, delete value, set value, blah, uh, list them all. And then what you can do is you can store them just as values, just as just as main values, right? But then you can also have contexts. So this is a container of multiple I contexts. So it behaves as though it's an I context, but it's actually a collection of more of them. So what that means is that you can have a context that apply to the application application settings or something like that. But when you're within a form, you can use a context object. You still have access to them. You can also have a context that's specific to the form as well. It becomes very much like a scope in Delphi. So you could just as well call this a scope. And so using that, you can then have your local scope and behind that, perhaps you've got your global scope and context can get their value, can either just store their values, as I say, just like in dictionary, like this main value, or they can go and fetch them from APIs, for example. Uh, so uh, uh, context objects here, for example, this one here will actually go and re read and write its values using the properties of the object that you have passed in as a parameter. And that's exactly what happened in, in this other, one here, and this, and then I'll finish off. Uh, that's what happened here. Is that when we go look at this, these are the form values. These are available to entire form. It doesn't matter what we're looking at. These are the same because they apply to the application as a whole to this whole form. But this one here has critter values and critter fields as additional uh, context objects that are specific to that particular one there. So whenever we go look for the size of something, so for example here, let's, oh, no, I don't have, yeah. Um, let's say we delete that critter, we delete critter value, this one here. Can we do that? If we do Oh no, oh, never mind. I don't, I, I don't have time for that. But, but basically what, what we're doing is we're saying that this critter um, has its own, its own specific contexts. So whenever we create a new critter, we say, yeah, 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 you take whatever context is given to you, i.e. the form context. And then also, so then there it is. Also, I want you to use my own values and my own properties as well. So whenever you look for a value, you start off with my properties. If you couldn't find it, you start you try the values. If you couldn't find it, then you try the, try the global context. So that way you can have the one object that gives you access with scope of values from a range of different parts of the application. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, um, question time.
Wow, you're all asleep. Okay, well, okay, I'll do this. I'll go to here and I'll say, okay, that's 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 there. So we all use patterns. For some reason, we all use patterns. The bigger toolbox and more versatility, less reinventing of wheels. No, no, and there's some really nifty patterns that will then help you uh, if you don't know know many of them. And remember, just using patterns does not make you good. It's it's just that they they're very helpful. Um, yeah, so that's me there. Batsoft library contains these things and a few other things as well. And um, you can get everything and more um, on uh, at, at, at that link over there. So yes, I think now that's now that's it. Questions? Yes, that's it. Good job. Anything? Uh, Anyone? Here, there's something we talked about before. Matthias mentioned that he was interested in doing a managing a study group and through the user group. Mm, mm. We were trying to wrangle you into doing one as well. Have you got any thoughts on that? Um, well, I was thinking that um, there's a lot here that I have been, have been covered and I could take more time to actually cover things more carefully and more interactively rather than just churning out a bunch of words. You guys could actually be a bit more involved. And also, um, it also mean that th that would just be a starter and then the group could continue having their own, their own uh, submissions as well. Yeah, we're, we're thinking about something similar to what Matthias mentioned this morning. Mm. Um, getting together on a f basically reoccurring, whether that's once a month or once every two or three months, um, just whatever people are interested in. So for everyone listening, if you can keep that in mind, we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. We'll, uh, we'll send out some, some posts um, on the forum. Let's see if we can get that started up. Mm. Uh, what about books? Are there any particular books that you think would help people get started, particularly people coming in new to design patterns? Any any books that no, don't bother with books. So, um, so um, you just look online. Uh, the wiki one's pretty good, actually. The uh, the Wikipedia one. Um, where the hell is that gone? Software design patterns. Oh, yeah. Um, you just scrolled past. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here, this is this this is a good start. But I mean, they what? Yeah, not the design pattern. Yeah, this page here is pretty good. Then it shows creational patterns, for example, a whole bunch of there, uh, structural patterns. Uh, composites, uh, decorators, facades, flyways, etc. Behavioral patterns, command, interpreter, mediator, memento, um, and so on. This is a good, and then concurrency pattern, which I hadn't had a chance to even look at in this presentation, but there are a whole bunch of them here. So these are the most commonly established patterns, but like I say, when you come across your own, um, your own recurring idea that someone else has not yet defined as a pattern, give it a name, and then uh, it's a pattern, something that you use often. So that's probably the best, the first place I'd, I'd start with actually, that's pretty good. Uh, you'll find the patterns will be, you'll find the same patterns repeated, which is reasonable. Um, uh, but as I said before, don't get hung up on the correct way to do something. So if we go look at a prototype, for example, I don't know, it's picking something at random. Um, it, it, they'll have these diagrams, and these are good are good for getting a hang of what is what is meant by the pattern. But it, doing it differently doesn't mean that you're not using a pattern. It just means you. It's like I say, it's the gist of it that's important. That's my view, anyway. Um, I'm not so hard on the on the rigidity. Um, is anyone actually awake after all that? Was, was that all right? There are a few people who've put up their hands, Scott. Uh, where are the hands being put up? I don't see I can those. see four, actually. Oh, oh okay. yes, there we go, four. Yeah, Shane, right. go ahead. Shane. Yeah, um, I remember hearing a talk a couple of years ago, quite a few years ago, by Colin, where he made the point about patterns being really a language. And that was the beauty of, of patterns, where... 
um, you know, I could basically say, oh, yeah, yeah, we need a memento feature on this and instantly mm. you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and so uh, so its value was partially in, in just having that shorthand language that could be used. Um, but what I've found um, uh, interesting about patterns and then reading about patterns is it's um, sometimes you just look at it and like you said, you just do it and you're going, oh, so there's a name for what I've already been doing. Um, mm -hmm. But then in your demo today, you've suddenly started seeing, oh, wait a minute, here's an approach to programming that's different to, um, to what I do. So in one sense, um, patterns are like a toolbox where you can reach in and go, oh, mate, here's a tool to do something that I've just wouldn't have done it that way. Um, but then you suddenly reach into your toolbox and you go, oh, I need a hammer. And you suddenly discover that you've got everything from a... Um, you know, a, a little to a, a giant sledgehammer. Mm. Um, and so um, uh, uh, observer patterns, for example, um, you can go, oh, wait a minute, you, you demonstrate an observer panel, uh, pattern, which is local to your events, but then you could go, oh, wait a minute, I want an observer pattern between two apps on the same device. Oh, wait a minute, I want an observer pattern that runs across a network. And so suddenly yeah. the way you implement them is totally different because you suddenly have to start drink, okay. dragging in messaging or whatever. Exactly. Um, but but con you know, the, the language is still the same. I want an observer pattern just between this. Um, and so there's a dozen ways of implementing it. Um, and I think the other interesting thing is as people are looking at your code, they're going, oh, I would have done it this way. Um, and so just because you're using patterns doesn't mean that you're necessarily doing good code. It's just that you've got a label for your crap code or good code. So, mm. um, but yeah, I'd, I'd have to say, you know, patterns, the concept of patterns definitely extended me as a programmer and opened up a world of, of um, different ways of doing things. Mm. And that's I mean, uh, I mean, you get some pretty smart people who have found some pretty good solutions to, to problems that, you wouldn't have thought of, and those are good. So, yeah, I'll do that too. So well, we have a few questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we have a couple other questions I'd like to run through. Uh, Tony Bryan, you have a question? Please unmute. Yep. Yeah. Still muted. There we go. Sorry, that was just an answer to the are you awake question. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Robert Horry Smith. Uh, just a quick question about uh, modeling and uh, doing uh, designs, mm. uh, particularly something like UML. Do you have any tools that you can use to? Um, I, I tend to draw things on paper and I tend to document things uh, using Visio because that's the stuff I have available. Um, I have my own, uh, sort of my own, um, way of of presenting that so let's see if i can uh, i don't know if this is the this is the one i'm looking for yeah so this is how this this is the yeah the way i do things so it's loosely based on uml and if i remember correctly from my uml book it said you don't need to follow it strictly um, and the reason why I do this, this is a combination of, of the old Pascal way of doing things that I was taught, taught at uni about, uh, about almost 30 years ago. Um, but uh, then we also have, uh, have a few extra things. So I've used it for many years and it's much tidier, I find, than using UML modeling programs. And the thing is, I find having a pen in hand, it just helps me think better. And so rather than having things like one and zero to one, I just, just have a pointer, you know, or one to zero to star, it's a double pointer. This here means owns. This is like a pointer, except B is, it, it is an interface. So it's, it's totally abstract and things like that. So then when I have, have a diagram like this, it becomes very clear. Things as a singleton object, uh, and I combine class diagrams and object diagrams as well. The rest of the UML diagrams I tend to use pretty much as they're supposed to be. 
but when it comes to class and object diagrams, I don't separate them because I find one loses context. We have an object diagram without the class hierarchy, for example, or interface hierarchy. Uh, like I say, this is an interface implemented by these different other cl uh, classes. You lose a lot of context. So I prefer combining them so you have that context. So in this case, for example, this is a single term. It points to one of these. This owns a bunch of those. But looking at this here, we can see that it owns a bunch of, bunch of objects. And so um, we can start seeing, for example, nothing owns the engine. So what's going to free the engine? You see, this diagram means owns. So this, this diamond means owns. Nothing owns the engines. Who's freeing these engines? And we, we can now see very clearly um, lifetime responsibilities and things like that. Yeah, what did you use to draw that, uh, Peter? This one I used Visio, and I just go, I think it's the, uh, just the very simple shapes uh, option. Yeah, got you. Thank you. I am, um, uh, Robert, another inexpensive uh, UML diagramming tool that's actually uh, very quick and fast to use is one called Catafra. I posted a link in the um, in the uh, Zoom chat. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. And there's another question from Kev. Yes, yeah, thanks, uh, Peter. I was interested in looking further at the Batsoft library. If you just pulled it up, um, noticed it had uh, had GPL for the the licensing. I was wondering if there's any other options for that. Uh, GPL for the license. General public. Well, um, I've actually asked to have it replaced to, to, to something akin to this. It's donationware, so you're allowed to use it for both commercial and personal projects for free as much as you like. But I, I just ask, you know, just don't, don't, don't say like, uh, don't claim it to be yours or anything like that. But it's my effort. But then on the other hand, you can use it as much as you like. And if you like it, you're welcome to um, encourage me financially, especially seeing as I'm out of work and, and I need some income. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Thanks. Uh, okay, we're just looking at the time here. We were scheduled to start with Michael Cantu in about uh, five minutes, but we haven't had a break Ooh. yet. So I think we will take a 15 minute break. Um, actually, let's do this if we say aiming at new start time uh, on the hour. So that is uh, two, uh, 3 p.m. AEST, roughly about 20 minutes time. So you can head on back to the Wonder Me room. Um, or you can chat in here, whatever you want to do. Um, and the files for all presenters will be made available to all attendees. So uh, they're all Peter's available already, here. Everything's uh, Peter's there. If if you want to uh, jump, like if if you're interested, you can you can go find them here as well. That's public. Yeah. Scott, do you mind if I have thirty seconds just to talk for the continuity group? Uh, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, a lot of people would know me and know that I'm a part of the continuity group along with uh, uh, Steve Arena is, uh, as well. And uh, Steve, unfortunately, is moving house today, couldn't be with us. Um, but um, yeah, so the continuity group is all about making sure that Delphi developers uh, are well supported and that they can, there's a future for their projects, basically. A lot of people, I assume, are being asked um, what happens to this project by they asked by their customers, what happens to this project if you're not around anymore? And that's a hard question to answer where we try and um, uh, give people a better answer to that question. And then they probably Many of us have been developing software for our customers for quite a while now. We help our customers find solutions to their problems. But there's one problem that most of us don't have a good solution for, and that's when your customer asks you. That's not an easy question for a solo developer to answer, but the Continuity Group is here to help you with that. We'll help you put plans in place that will give your customer peace of mind that their investment in your software is safe. So come find us during the breaks today and learn more about how we help Delphi developers answer these questions and more.